So I, it's my privilege to introduce um, Dr. Robert A. Emmons. He's professor of psychology at UC Davis, and he is an expert on the science of gratitude. He's had many, many years of research in that field, and he's the founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of P Positive Psychology. And I just want to close in the introduction with a quote from Dallas Willard on the back of the hardback version of his book that says, Based upon a solid and growing body of research, Robert Emmons presents clear and practical ways in which everyone can begin to immensely improve their quality of life, starting right now, right where they are. Thank you. Wow, it's really great uh, to be here. Um, you know, the last time I spoke at a chapel, was uh, actually the only time I've ever spoken at a chapel. And that was also in a gymnasium up at UC Davis, except we call it the pavilion. And instead of 1,200 uh, students, there were 12. Uh, and those students were the UC Davis bas men's basketball team. So uh, the head coach has a um, policy where he likes to invite faculty to be their special guests at a home game during the season. So it includes, among other things, it's really cool, you get to go to the uh, practice that afternoon uh, of the team, you get included in the pregame meal, which is at a local uh, pizza restaurant, which is pretty much all we have in Davis, it's pizza or uh, Chinese food, so take your pick, that's all we have, that's not Santa Barbara. Um, and then there's seats for us, uh, three seats, so uh, one of our sons, my wife and I, at uh, court side with our names on them, which is really cool. And then we got invited into the locker room for the pregame pep talk. Okay, so, and it wasn't just any game. So this was last March, and the basketball team, they were playing for the Big West Conference Championship uh, against UC Santa Barbara, uh, oddly enough. Okay, and so it was a really big game. They hadn't lost at home uh, all season, has unbeaten uh, streak, which was really amazing because the year before, it was just the opposite. They hadn't won a game. In fact, we went from uh, worst to first in a single uh, season. Okay, now, so if we won this game, they would have clinched the championship, right? Now, I'm a gratitude professor, as you've uh, probably gotten that hint uh, from this morning, and so I figured, well, that's what I should talk about. That's kind of what they want me to talk about. What I thought to myself, what in the world am I going to say about gratitude to the student athletes? What's the connection between gratitude and athletic performance? It seems like it would have nothing to do with athletic performance, right? When you're competitive, you want to beat down your opponent. You're not grateful for them, right? It seemed like gratitude would be, you know, would not contribute to much success at all. In fact, it would just be the opposite kind of mental state that you would want to conjure up as you prepared yourself for competition. Well, of course, I had to find an angle, so I did. I and mean, I thought about this a lot. Uh, in fact, this talk, it was like 10 minutes, right? They told me you could talk for eight minutes. I stretched it to like 10 and then to 20. As you know, it's really hard for a professor to stop talking once they start. Uh, you know that already, right? But anyway, so the angle I took was I talked about how gratitude improves performance. Gratitude enhances performance. In fact, in nearly every realm in which it's been studied, whether it's relational, academic, spiritual, psychological, but also athletic, gratitude is the ultimate performance-enhancing substance. I thought, that's kind of cool, right? Because this one is a good one, though. It's legal. It's perfectly legal, right? There's no, there's no testing for it, right? And so on. And we know that from the science of gratitude, that gratitude works. That gratitude has the ability to heal, to energize, and to change lives. Now, bringing that to bear on athletic performance is a little bit more difficult to demonstrate, but it's possible because I suggested four ways in which gratitude can help you perform and help them perform that evening and beyond that evening for the rest of their career and also the rest of their lives. Because we know that gratitude brings calm energy. When a person is grateful or practicing grateful, you're energized, you're focused, you're attentive, but you're also calm. It's almost a paradox. How can you be calm and energized at the same time? Well, there's nervous energy. As I was that 
day when I gave that talk. It's like, you know, it's like a big deal. You know, the basketball team, it doesn't sound like it would be, but I had spoken to thousands of students in almost 30 years of teaching, but I was never more nervous that day uh, in that locker room, you know, which is strange, but just the way, you know, you just have, don't have control over sometimes uh, your anxiety level. Number two, gratitude facilitates reaching more goals. When you are grateful, you are more successful at actually reaching your goals. You extend more effort, you get more assistance from other people, you acknowledge the benefits they provide for you. So, hey, who doesn't want to achieve goals when you're an athlete? You have goals to perform well to the best of your ability. You need to be calm, to be focused, not to be overwhelmed with anxiety. Reducing stress and burnout, bouncing back more quickly following defeat, faster recovery from stress. All of these are qualities that are enhanced when a person is grateful or practicing grateful mindset. And then lastly, it makes you more likable, more helpful. You're likely to get more and give more support. So we need that from teammates, right? You need to get your support, to have each other's back and so forth. So a number of ways in which gratitude worked uh, for athletic performance. I thought that was pretty clever of me to uh, link it that way, right, and so on. Uh, so the game starts, right, and it's not going so well for the team. And they're losing, they're down. It's like the worst game they've played all season. And it's like they're behind by 20 points, like, you know, 30 seconds into the game. Not quite, but, you know, uh, it was pretty bad, right? And people are looking at each other like, well, you know, what the heck's going on? And, you know, and they're substituting different players, trying to find the right combination. And so during one of the timeouts, uh, my son, 13 years old at the time, he kind of, you know, elbows me. And he says, you know, Dad, you realize that if they lose, it's going to be your fault. <laughs> because... They haven't lost yet, and you never spoke to them. You spoke to them today, and they're losing. <laughs> I turned to him. I said, well, son, I don't think I have that much power over their performance today. They're going to lose or win quite apart from anything I did or did not do. Okay. But he implanted this idea in my head that I, made me so nervous the rest of the game. Like, I don't know, maybe they were thinking that, right? Maybe the coach was thinking that. We're not going to have this guy in again, right? We're going to scrap this program of having faculty come and talk to our players because it made them nervous and unable to perform. Well, eventually we start clawing our way back into the game, getting a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Finally, within the last minute, uh, we took the lead for the first time, right? And the place is going bonkers, right? I'm thinking, okay, it's starting to look a little bit better. I can start to breathe again, right? And so on. Uh, and then uh, in the last second, they held off Santa Barbara and they won the game. They won the championship, right? It was a great moment. Everybody rushed onto the uh, court, right? And it was so cool. So I turned to my son and said, they won because of me. I, I took the credit for it, right? <laughs> I wasn't going to get the blame, but I wanted to get the credit. Well, isn't that the way it is? We, we, we clamor for credit in everything that we do, right? We want people to know of our contribution. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit, kind of tie that together with some ideas I've been thinking about today with respect to the gospel. Now, we shall all begin, of course. It always begins with the Bible, with the scripture. So the scripture I want to share with you today from Colossians let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, as we sang moments ago, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, what I want to point out about this scripture, of course, there's many scriptures on giving thanks, being thankful, thankfulness. In fact, the word thanks, thanksgiving, thankfulness occurs over 150 times in the Hebrew scriptures, Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament. Now, there's two ways to think about how to do thanks, how to give thanks, how to be grateful. I think there, there's a good way and a not so good way. There's a correct way that brings life and encouragement and hope and joy. And there's a way to do it which brings the opposite. Uh, it's more of a burden. Uh, it's, it's, it's laden with guilt. It makes life heavier, more oppressive rather than easier, lighter, and freer. That's a distinction I want to talk to you about. But first, let's do a little theology today. Can we do that? 
I don't often get to do theology at UC Davis. Uh, you know, occasionally you know, I try to sneak it in and call it something else. Uh, but I think it's okay to do that here. Right, President? Mr. President, we can do that? Okay, good. We're good. See, the thing is, and I tell my students this too when I teach psychology of religion, is that we're all theologians. I mean, to be a theologian simply means to have thoughts about God, to say things about God, right? Theos, God, Logos, words, right? To speak things. So I tell my class, I say, even if you're an atheist and you say there is no God, that's a theological statement, right? I mean, it's bad theology, but I don't tell them that. I don't tell them it's bad theology, but you're still a theologian. Okay? If you say, I don't know if God exists, that's a theological statement too. So we all do theology one way or another. Well, here's a theological distinction. Now, I don't know if I have time to, I might regret introducing this, but I think it's a really, really important distinction. And I know you guys are really, really smart. So I'm going to try it out and we'll see uh, how it goes. So in the Bible, there's two types of statements. Okay? There are what are known as uh, indicatives. Okay, is one type of statement. An in indicative is a statement of fact. Okay? If I say, for example, my iPhone uh, is on the uh, pulpit here, that's a fact. Right? It's a statement of fact. Okay? It's a declaration. Okay? Uh, in the Bible, a declaration indicative statement says what God has done for us. Particularly what God has done for us in Christ. Okay? It's really the God side of the equation. Those are the indicatives. Okay, so there are commandments in the Bible to give thanks, for example, to uh, speak words of blessing. Right? And the Ten Commandments obviously are uh, declarative uh, statements. Okay? That's one way, that's one type of statement in the Bible. Okay? The other type of statement, though, are imperatives. An imperative is what we need to do. It's command to do something. Okay, uh, it's an obligation. It's a uh, response to what has already been done to us. So, a way to think about this is there's a God side to the equation, and then there's the human side to the occasion. Okay, now it's really critical this distinction to understand the writings of Paul, but to understand Scripture more generally, and then to understand how to approach the Christian life. So, I'm just going to give this you know, kind of what I've learned being a psychologist. And a professor, true, but more importantly, being a Christian and being someone who tries to follow the gospel and accept what Christ has done on my behalf, things I could never do for myself. So what's really important is we get the sequence right between indicatives and imperatives when it comes to gratitude. So here's three points. Okay? Number one, the imperative flows from and depends on the indicative. In other words, what we should do should always be based on what God has already done for us. Right? If we try to be uh, grateful because we feel we ought to be, well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but I want to say is that we need to first focus on what's been done for us, and then gratitude flows almost immediately and automatically from that. And so in the Bible, it looks like this. God has done this. Therefore, you should do that. The word therefore is used a lot of times in the Bible. And when you see the word therefore, you should ask, what is it there for? Right? And what is it there for? It's to point us back to the indicative. Okay? Indicating what God has done for us before we need to do anything back to give back that good that we've received. So, need to keep the sequence in the correct order. This failing to do so can lead to a lot of confusion between religion and the gospel, between what we ought to do, between following laws, rules, versus what God has actually done for us, which is the gospel. So what does this have to do with gratitude? Okay, let me give you a couple other quotes from uh, Colossians. So the previous one from Colossians 3 is preceded by Colossians 2, verse 7 is preceded by verse 6. Verse 6 says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, that's the indicative, right? You have received. We have received Jesus. Continue to live your lives in Him. So that's the imperative, right? What to do based on what we've been given. 
rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Okay, so there is the command to be thankful, but it doesn't come out of anywhere. It comes out of the context of receiving this gift of Jesus. Look also Colossians 3.1. This is great because there's both indicatives and imperatives wedged within. Does that distinction, have you ever heard that one before? Anybody? Good. So we're learning stuff today. Uh, and if I'm wrong, I hope I'm not, but your pastor will correct uh, afterwards. After this. But I think it's a really good, it helps me think about uh, where gratitude should actually come from. All right. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Okay, so, what would be the, you know, indicatives in this? Well, you have, you have been raised. That's a statement of what has happened, right? You have been, we have been, we've all been raised with Christ. The imperative is then, therefore, seek the things above. Okay, set your mind on things above. So those are the two imperatives, seek and set based on the fact we have been raised with Christ. For you died and your life is now, there's another indicative right there, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So that's the distinction, right? Imperatives, indicatives. What's been done what we do in the context or in light of what's already been done. Now, let's apply that to gratitude. It seems to me there's two motivations to be grateful, to be thankful, that flow from these two perspectives, the imperatives and the indicatives. So one motivation for gratitude is fear and guilt. You ought to be grateful because, you know, uh, if you don't, you will upset people. You upset your parents, you upset your grandparents, you upset God, you won't get their approval, you won't get their love if you are not grateful. Okay? Fear and guilt, which can lead to moralism or legalism, not the gospel, not based in gospel truths. The focus winds up being on ourselves. We wind up getting so obsessed with how we are doing in our own sin. It's not a very good breeding ground. It's not a very fertile ground to grow gratitude in an authentic sense. Okay. We feel obligated to give thanks. The focus becomes on how we are doing. Okay. Uh, I used to think that growing in gratitude meant I had to go out and work harder to do something that I hadn't done before. Uh, then I realized I just needed to focus more in the reality of what I had already received in Jesus. And that's the basis for gratitude. Think about this. You know, when you're told to write a letter of thanks, as most parents try to uh, pound into their kids, when I talk to parents, the number one question they ask them is, how can I get my kids to be more grateful? And the answer I give them is, I don't think the one they want to hear, and that is, well, you cannot give your kids something that you yourself don't have. So, right, see, they get that. So they know, no, I'm, I'm, I don't say exactly like that. But what I want to say is that, we don't have much time, so I have to cut to the chase. Uh, we impart this, we teach it, they catch these virtues from us. They're not so much, you know, taught as caught. We have to, ex you know, be role models and express that, express our gratitude to them if they want us, uh, if we want them to be grateful. The old thing about, you know, you need to eat all your Brussels sprouts because kids over the other side of the world are starving. I mean, does that ever work? Right? You should be thankful you have Brussels sprouts to eat. Has that ever motivated a kid to eat Brussels sprouts? No. It wouldn't, doesn't work, right? The fear, the guilt, it, it doesn't work. You, you might get them to go along with it, you know, to bind to the program for a short time, but it's not going to create any long-term sustained thankfulness. The other motivation, though, is grace, out of grace and faith. We're grateful because of grace, because of the gospel, because what's been done for us, Jesus doing for us what we could never do or provide for ourselves. This is a focus on Christ, not a focus on the life of the Christian. See, I think a lot of people have this feeling that the Bible is all about the life of the Christian. It's this guidebook to Christian living. It's this recipe or cookbook. What do I need to do? 
Now, certainly there's a lot of commands in there about what to do. There are the uh, imperatives, but they're all based on the indicatives, what's already been done, which leads to more of a spontaneous, I want to be grateful because of I've been already gifted in all these various ways, things being done for me that I could never deserve, earn, or merit on my own. So it's a team effort. You know, like the basketball team had a team effort that night. This is a team effort between God and between us what God has done and our response to that which God has done. See, in my mind, it all begins with grace. When we experience the grace of God, we inhale that. How can we be anything but grateful? Right? That's the natural response. Grace and gratitude go together like heaven and earth, one writer said. What are we grateful for? Well, everything. I mean, God is given us the gift of salvation, right? He's replaced our sin with his salvation, our faults with forgiveness, our badness with his goodness, right? It's just the list goes on and on of everything that God has done, re rescued us, redeemed us, accepted us, approved us, cleansed us of our sins. I mean, if that doesn't result in gratitude, I mean, I don't know what would, but it's all based in the gospel, receiving this free gift, not out of fear or guilt, not to try to get God's pleasure or God's favor, okay? Our gratitude doesn't direct God's favor. Our gratitude reflects God's favor. That's really what I've learned about gratitude and connecting it to the gospel. Do you know who this is? Bono, right? Okay, Bono is somebody who's very interesting to read him and read about in his interviews. With, and he talks about grace quite a bit. He said grace is a mind-blowing concept. It really is. You know, that's why it's called amazing grace, radical grace. Do you believe, he said, that the God who created the universe might be looking for company, a relationship with people? What keeps me on my knees is the difference between grace and karma. You know, karma, you get what you deserve. Well, grace is you get what you don't deserve. You get way better than you deserve. Okay? The consequences of your actions are interrupted with love. I've done a lot of stupid stuff. I have. I don't know if you have or not, but a lot of us have. Thank God for grace. He says grace changes everything. I want to give you an action plan before I finish here. Uh, something to do. As I told the team that night, I want them to think about Gratitude in the context of sports. When you win, even if you don't win, I don't want you to thank mom, which is, you know, normative when athletes are on the camera. Thank you, mom, or thank God, which is also good uh, to thank too. Uh, when you're successful or when you're even not successful, I gave them some action plans for thinking about gratitude. Can you, this is something you can do. You could write down one thing you're grateful for each day for the next 30 days. Start today. And then post that on your social media. I don't know what social media you use. Uh, if you use Facebook, if you use Instagram, there's a whole bunch of social medias. I have no clue what they are, but people, you know, much younger than me use them. They change all the time. And, but then hashtag that with 30 days of gratitude. I asked, I talked last week to, at Southwest Airlines in Dallas, and I started them on a 21-day gratitude program, which took them right up to Thanksgiving just worked out that way. It was great. Beautiful that it worked out that way. But you can go beyond that. So they're going to stop on Thanksgiving, but your gratitude is going to go beyond because you don't, you don't want to leave gratitude on a Thanksgiving table, right? You want to extend it beyond that. So one day, one thing each day, post that on your social media, 30 days of gratitude and people will know. It's more effective when you, when you pronounce it, when you broadcast it, when you distribute your gratitude. It's more effective than just keeping it personal, keeping it private. So let me close with a scripture. My favorite book in the Bible is Romans. And Romans chapter 8 might be my favorite chapter uh, in the book of Romans where Paul who makes this distinction throughout between the indicatives and the imperatives. But now he's saying if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us when we think we're going to be separated, when we no longer deserve, feel like we're getting the love of God? No one can separate us from that love. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, not in all things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I love this part. 
uh, the end of Romans 38, 39. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth, and nothing, he's saying, will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, isn't that amazing truth? That nothing's going to separate us, right? I mean, no matter what's happening, I mean, what trials we're going, no matter what's happening in the world, when things look the bleakest, that's when God breaks through with his love, right? I mean, that's the ground, that's the proper ground for gratitude. So Father God, we thank you for these truths in your holy and inspired word. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. Amazing grace, what was accomplished on our behalf that we could never do for ourselves. We thank you for that today. We ask that you press this truth into every person here. Press it down deep. Help us to experience gratitude and its freeing power and its liberating power today, tomorrow, next week, next month, beyond, so that we can express to the world all that you've done in Christ. And we pray in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.